Thank you, thank you, Monica, for continuing to uh, invite me to these conferences. Um, I always feel a little bit out of place, uh, a little bit like a dissonant voice that just can't uh, get in tune with the, the vibe. So um, I can't help it. This is who I am. So with that, I'll um, proceed to um, talk about my version of this conference theme. Um, I'm interested in the future of design, but I'm interested in it in a much a broader context. Um, I would like to put a question mark behind the conference title um, and perhaps question a little bit this notion of the individual artist that kind of stands outside of society and kind of exerts its individual genius on the world. Um, it is uh, wonderful, don't get me wrong, that um, we now have uh, a woman architect that has joined um, this all boys club and broken the glass ceiling. And for those of you who aspire to this, you can consider it done, check that box and get on with your life. I'm much more interested in the other 98, 99% of you who will build the uh, environments that we live in every day. And um, if you look at what their concerns are, you might actually have a little bit of a glimpse of the future. Um, I think this uh, idea, again, of looking at um, women as possibly um, the way that the profession evolves is very perplexing um, a lot for um, young men who find themselves now uh, in the minority in architecture schools. Um, certainly at the University of Virginia. Uh, women are 55% of the student body, and they're averaging about 40%. So, um, so there's a kind of identity crisis going on here. Don't underestimate that. Um, I'd like to broaden my sense of what the future of design is and talk about how um, you are, how you use, or how you engender uh, a culture that even values what design excellence is in the everyday. And uh, really not just uh, the design for the few, for the 2% who can afford it, uh, but design uh, for all. So um, I kind of shifted the title of the conference and uh, made it design, the future of design for all. And uh, when you start to talk about uh, that level of inclusion, um, you have to have a, a slightly uh, different conversation. You have to talk about what is relevant to most people in their daily lives. And what do we do that somehow has value to them? Um, and I would argue that it has to be a lot broader uh, than the conversations that we have when we gather to talk about what is important to us. We've had some help. Um, places like Target and Ikea um, have addressed the issue of the mass consumption of well-designed products. Um, I think that can be uh, a benefit to us. And, uh, and people like uh, Michael Graves that design for Target, uh, where all of a sudden the issue of good design and mass accessibility um, is uh, a norm. I'm more interested in that photograph, uh, more interested in the teapot, less interested in the teapot, more interested in the chair that he's sitting in, which uh, allows him mobility as a result of his uh, neurological disease. Um, so the idea of access and accessibility uh, to all types as being a, a future. But um, in the end, um, I've found that in the circles that I'm um, traveling in, it seems to be more important to uh, reposition the role of the designer um, away from something that society thinks of as a, a, style, a styler of very exquisite objects um, to uh, something that talks about designers as problem solvers and that their interest is to uh, represent the public's interest. So it's a very external uh, and inclusive 
uh, role. So uh, it requires uh, designers to um, think of themselves as facilitators. So the planet um, is going to hell in a basket and our profession is responsible for about 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So effectively, we had better be in a position to be able to facilitate a dialogue that is going on nationally. And what is our role in bringing those voices together? Or designers whose concerns are about how to address everyday common sense problems of how you turn stream water into drinking water or how you transport water uh, that doesn't uh, destroy your spine. Um, these, are, these are areas that suggest that our relevancy comes in our ability to solve big problems that affect millions of people. Uh, and then ultimately, um, you have to be somewhat of an agitator to be a designer. Um, and um, an advocate, a provocateur, an instigator, uh, and someone who is trying to give voice to those who traditionally don't have access to design, but who need it the most. And if you can do something that's relevant to this population, there is a great chance that your work, or our work, has um, significant impact. So I start from uh, a, um, a proposition of what if uh, broad and popular access to quality design were understood as a basic democratic right. And, uh, and moving in away from the idea of it simply as a, a consumer product. So who needs a design the most? Um, what are the answers uh, for the thousands of New Orleanians who are still trying to get home. Um, or a Katrina survivor in Biloxi um, who chooses uh, you know, a, an African-American architect, myself, and this is a, uh, the guy in the truck um, grew up during segregation and chose uh, an African-American architect to design his house because of the strategy of making his house accessible now at uh, 10 feet above the ground. Or, uh, you know, an African-American woman who is choosing a Vietnamese-American architect to design her house. I mean, the, the boundaries uh, completely um, get blurred when you're talking about real needs uh, and the ability to bring innovative solutions to those needs. So. I, I think that um, if we can show that design can solve real problems, um, I think that our relevancy in our future will be that much stronger. Um, so design, and as I am framing it, t depends on the ability to offer new solutions to uh, relevant societal challenges and problems that have no easy answers. So there are tens of thousands of foreclosed homes in, um, in Cleveland. What can the design profession provide that city that talks about a new form of, of neighborhood that will never be uh, dense again? What can, the, what can a landscape architect contribute uh, to the future of design? I mean, is it possible to imagine a new form of urbanism that is based on the insertion and the integration of landscape as a part of defining this new neighborhood, limiting carbon footprint, the heat island effect, and growing food locally? This is not a solution that a banker <laughs> or a mortgage lender would come up with. Uh, if design can show our ability to tackle these issues, then I think our future is, um, is pretty good. So uh, at the National Endowment for the Arts, um, I fund um, nonprofits. I fund 
groups that have a broad constituency, uh, and that includes uh, the academy with uh, 115 accredited schools of architecture across 45 states, you can begin to imagine the impact those places could have as laboratories for finding transformative solutions to problems. The trend is clearly towards um, funding more of them. So half of the um, awards given out in design innovation uh, last spring went to schools of architecture, which was like nine. There are 115 schools of architecture. Uh, you can imagine the capacity, the potential capacity of those organizations if they were turning externally to look at problems that are of the everyday. And what I mean by that, the um, funding of uh, a project at the University of Arkansas, a community design center, um, where the architect uh, who leads that design center tackled the notion of scenario planning for the entire um, region of his state, bringing together hundreds of people to imagine what uh, Arkansas would look like if it were organized around issues of transit mobility, a light rail, the form of urbanism that would, um, would, it would produce, and the type of commerce that might emerge. Or uh, in Chicago, this is dealing with this notion of building a constituency for design and the role of educating young people in visual literacy and the notion of design as problem solving, taking a problem, turning it into a project, testing, research, building, and watching its performance. Uh, if you build um, this capacity, you're building a constituency for the future of design. Or Houston, uh, a community design center uh, that accepts and acknowledges that the majority are now the minority and they have to completely rethink how students are prepared to engage um, constituents who in all of these seven neighborhoods are now either majority African-American or majority Latino. Um, so the problems that they try to solve are different. Uh, how do you create a receiving place for uh, day laborers um, that congregate in that particular neighborhood? Or the University of Detroit, their design center, and the funding of a project here to use um, shipping containers uh, that then incorporate uh, a lattice system to create a, a, a center for homeless services uh, to be distributed. Um, or Mississippi State um, that is looking at giving people whose homes have been damaged or need to be restored um, access to designers as, um, and they as clients, um, giving them one-to-one -one service as uh, designers. So all of these people who never had any expectation of design uh, now are part of a constituency who understand what design does and how it affects their life. Um, one, as one other aspect of what we do is uh, taking design to very remote places uh, like Montana and talking about how you read places um, through your own perception uh, and experience and turn that into a resource uh, that can, dri uh, can drive an economy. Um, or another rural area, Plains, Georgia, um, where Georgia Tech um, gathered 30 Latino nonprofits that had never been assembled together to talk about how they can take their concerns out of the shadow and begin to use design as an instigator for bringing communities together, responding to a real demographic change in that state. Um, but I have the most um, uh, kind of enlightening experiences when I'm meeting with mayors um, through the Mayor's Institute on City Design. Some of you know of this, it's a very simple concept. Eight mayors, eight designers, eight case studies that the mayors bring three days in lockdown to talk about how to 
reframe the questions and how to raise the design excellence within the opportunities that these cities have. Uh, was just there, just in Boston yesterday, and will be in Charleston at the end of the month with the mayors of Dallas, San Antonio, um, uh, Richmond, Virginia, Niagara Falls. So the idea of these um, institutes is to transform these mayors into people who understand the power of design and their role uh, as leaders in that. So in Charleston, we will have over 3 million people represented in those eight mayors together with eight designers. So our ability to speak to others and facilitate that conversation is vitally important to the importance of design. Taking it up a notch as I conclude, um, we have a program called the Governor's Institute. And this is now assuming that if we want to bring about systemic change in the built environment, we have to get a hold of state policy. And so this is four designers, one mayor, and their, one governor, and their entire cabinet for three days talking about how you use state policy to um, affect change. An example of that is in Wyoming where this governor wanted to talk about affordable housing and wanted to convene um, the entire state, which in Wyoming is like 500 people, um, all to, to focus on this issue of affordable housing. Um, or the last example that I'll show of mayor of, um, he was a, an alum of the Mayor's Institute and he's now governor of Virginia, brought to us the challenge of the burden of um, financial burden of cul-de-sac developments on primary infrastructure. So the designers came up with a seven, seven recommendations, five of which have been passed into law, this one being the most sweeping that essentially bans cul-de-sac development in Virginia. All streets now have to be, and new subdivisions have to be connected. So with one three-day event and about 12 months of getting it through the legislature, um, we have made an, an enormous impact on uh, the urban development of a state. So I believe that our significance, our relevance, only increases when we can show that we have major impact on, on people's lives. And I hope that um, this cross-section gives you a little sense of how important it is that we learn to speak to others other than ourselves and leverage this extraordinary discipline that we have to the benefit of uh, the public interests. Thank you.